we have uh, been focusing on reading DNA for the last 40, 50 years. Uh, we've entered an era of reading and writing DNA, you know, if you like, in the last five, seven years. And we're now transitioning into an era that we call the social genome era, where many aspects of our life are going to be influenced by our own genetic and also other types of bio data, whether it's microbiome, immune, phenotypical data, etc. Um, so as this, the, these different data affect different parts of our day-to-day -day life, not just wellness and health and you know medicines, but also nutrition and exposure to different components in the environment, etc. You know, it's a very different world, and we will have some of the same questions that we're having today um, on the digital revolution, if you like, or out of the digital revolution. We're going to have the same in the bio revolution. So we are entering the era of the social genome. Boom, what's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakyan. We are in the beautiful Cambridge, Massachusetts. We are gonna be talking about the era of the social genome. We have Rodrigo Martinez joining us on the show. Hello. Hey, Alan, how are you? Good Thank to see you. Thank you so much for coming on. Yeah. It's actually round two from Arc Fusion That's that right. we did about a year ago. Yep. Rodrigo is the Chief Marketing and Design Officer at Veritas Genetics, where they do whole genome sequencing for under $1,000. And he's been doing that for three years. Prior to that, he spent six years as a life sciences chief strategist at IDEO. And with Juan Enriquez, he co-founded Harvard Business School's life sciences project and term bioeconomy. So let's jump into this, the era of the social genome. Teach us about what this is and why it's so important. Yeah. Um, look, we're, imagine we're in the early 90s and, uh, or even late 80s. There are a bunch of offices and government uh, projects that have really big computers. And some of us have our little, you know, Commodore 64 and, you know, you had your little Radio Shack computer and some of us are in the edge trying to uh, figure out what to do with these little things called computers, right? And there's no way that back then we can imagine things like Facebook and Google and Amazon Prime and election hacking and trolling and bullying and all of the opportunities and risks that we have today throughout our life out of the digital revolution, right? So that dimension, uh, you know, think about 20, 30 years, is sort of where we are in the bio world, right? We have uh, been focusing on reading DNA for the last 40, 50 years. Uh, we've entered an era of reading and writing DNA, you know, if you like, in the last five, seven years. And we're now transitioning into an era that we call the social genome era, where many aspects of our life are going to be influenced by our own genetic and also other types of bio data, whether it's microbiome, immune, phenotypical data, etc. Um, so as this, the, these different data affect different parts of our day-to-day -day life, not just wellness and health and you know, medicines, but also nutrition and exposure to different components in the environment, et cetera. Um, you know, it's a very different world. And we will have some of the same questions that we're having today um, on the digital revolution, if you like, or out of the digital revolution. We're gonna have the same in the bio revolution. So we are entering the era of the social genome. So this is a really good way of explaining it. And you guys did this in the blog article that you got that you posted that we see with computational capacity going from the mainframes to the desktop computers in our homes to the smartphones in our pockets and that with the whole genome it used to cost egregious billions of dollars over spans of a de over a decade to sequence a whole genome now it's down to less than a thousand dollars and the insights that we can gain from the genome to live a healthier and more fulfilling life. And th there's so many of these insights. So this is kind of like you, you're explaining, it's this revolutionary time for biotechnology to come in and start augmenting almost every single aspect of our existence. I want to hear from you what exactly this is doing because sometimes people um, don't necessarily know how does this even happen. Do we take a sample of my saliva and submit it into Veritas Genetics? Is this how we do this? Yeah, correct. So um, 
Yeah, we, we have basically a, a service both for consumers and for physicians and clinics and also for researchers. So consumers go to our website and veritasgenetics.com and they order a kit. Uh, they have to read some important documentation and get the proper you know, signatures. They have to give their consent, et cetera, because we're HIPAA uh, compliant, right? So they're a serious and also GDPR compliant, which is a standard uh, in Europe that we also support here uh, for all our customers. And then we send a kit to your home. It's a very simple kit. You spit on a little tube, send it back to us and we sequence uh, that DNA in our you know, top facilities uh, that are, have all the acronyms that you can imagine, CLIA, CAP, all of, you know, all of the acronyms to, to the highest standards. Uh, after we sequence, we then interpret those results and then you have a report that you can look online. It's a web-based report. You can also print it, but there's no point in printing it, really. You want to you wanna be able to access it on your phone, on your computer. Uh, and it basically details uh, some things that are in red, meaning these things are very important. You need to talk to your doctor about immediately. Like, you know, these could have significant life-threatening consequences. Uh, there's a section in yellow. Like, these are things, risks that you, uh, that you might, may have given uh, your genetic uh, map and things that you need to, you know, you need to know about, you need to talk to your doctor about, things that you could adjust in your lifestyle to reduce some of those risks, et cetera. And then there's a whole series of things that we think are, um, are, are fine to know, if you like. It's a bit more of infotainment, you know, all the traits and some ancestry, et cetera. Um, but our focus is mostly on things that are important for your health and that are actionable. And when we sit down together in the future, I want to really get into the science of how to actually take a saliva and turn that into over 6 billion characters, A's, T's, C's, and G's. Correct. And the, we can do that at a later time, but what I want to hear now is when I get this digital report, how do you know what is critical, red. How do you know what I need to act on right away? Is Correct. this specific locations in the sequence that I have some sort of a mutation that I need to go and take action on? Exactly. So we all have, you know, while we're more than 99.5 or 7 or 8 percent um, identical in our genomes, right? And you write 6.4 billion base pairs of letters. Um, we all have different variants, so somewhere between two and five million variants, right? And those variants mean there's changes in letters along our genome. Um, we know from some uh, different public databases what some of those variants mean, right? If you have an A instead of a T in this particular gene, we might know that that ha may increase your risk of a particular condition or a particular cancer or something like this, or it might mean that you are a carrier, for example, of cystic fibrosis. It doesn't mean that you have the condition, but you could pass it on to your children, right? So we know some of those things. Um, now, the key here is that we have, if not the best clinical team, we have one of the best clinical teams in the world, right? So we have uh, an incredibly experienced team that most, actually the largest uh, segment of our team, if you like, we have over 50 people doing interpretation from computer sciences, MDs, uh, engineers, doctors, geneticists, genetic counselors. So the interpretation of the result is really the key here, right? Sequencing is quickly becoming a commodity, right? You can sequence DNA in different machines in different countries, right? And you can get good quality data. The key here is who interprets that information so that it, you know it's done at a high quality. Okay, and then to be able to then act on some of the changes. Thank goodness we are now exploring the genetic engineering technologies that can take a mutation like a cystic fibrosis and be able to potentially change that so we don't pass it down to our children. So there's different things. Look, let's be very clear. We are still in step two out of 100 <laughs> of understanding and exploring everything in our genome. We are early on, right? But, but, but given that, there is already a lot of very useful information. And I'm happy to give you an example, if you like, on my genome. Yes, please. For example. So I have a, uh, a risk associated with a condition called pulmonary fibrosis. It does not mean that I'm going to die tomorrow from it, but 
certain lifestyle aspects could trigger as I grow older to create this fibroids in my lungs. So I stay away from construction sites, places where there are small particles, mm. either from stone, metal, wood, that by inhaling them, that could eventually trigger that condition in me. Mm. So I've adjusted my lifestyle in a way that is relatively easy, and that will probably have an effect on me not getting uh, these fibroids in my lungs, or at least delaying it, yes. right? And that's the type of thing where it's actionable, right? Mm -hmm. Now there are other things, for example, I carry three conditions that are not life-threatening, um, and when my wife and I decided to have a, a baby, uh, baby Julia, who's now six months old, we, we also noticed, or we also, she also knows in her genome that she does not carry those, so therefore we don't need to worry about that, and it's just good to know. Right, though that is more of a good to know. We can read some literature about it. You can, you know, you can prepare yourself. Now, there are some conditions where we know the risk of getting something like Alzheimer's. Right, if you have a an E4 variant in your APOE gene, you know that your your chances of getting Alzheimer's are much, much, much higher than the general population after a certain age. And my dad died of Alzheimer's, so this is sort of very personal to me. So I wanted to know if I had that variant. Um, one, because I wanted to prepare myself better. Now, I do not have that variant, which doesn't mean that I won't necessarily get the condition. I can get it for other reasons that it's not genetic, right? But I'm less likely to get it. But at least I've informed myself more about the latest literature, the latest studies, the latest clinical trials, etc. So even when you find out something in your genome that has to do with a, a terrible condition for which there is no treatment, that doesn't mean you can't do anything about it. You can inform yourself, you can find out who was doing the research, who were doing the clinical trials, right? And you think about it for, for your kid. If, if unfortunately, or, you know, or, or, or by genetic chance, uh, one of my two daughters had um, a condition that was genetically triggered, uh, even if there was no cure, I would go and make sure that I know everybody doing the, you know, the science at the edge of that field because I would want to be the first in line eventually to, to be there ready for a clinical trial or a treatment or something like this. And then what would it look like then to describe the difference between a whole genome sequence at Veritas versus what a 23andMe does, a Nebula Genomics? What would be the big difference? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So there's two main different technologies, genotyping and sequencing. So what 23andMe does and Ancestry DNA is genotyping, which is they look at a, a very small percentage uh, of, your, of your genome, right? So in the case of, of, of 23andMe, they will look at something like less than half of 1% of your whole genome, mm -hmm. right? And the technology allows you to ask questions for what you already have the answers for. So you're basically asking, is there an A here or yes? No. Okay, I know already what that means. Is there a T here? Yes, I know what that means. So you're basically asking questions for which you already have the answers to. You cannot go and ask additional questions, right? It's a one-time transaction and you have those answers and that's it. And that also, because of the, this technology, you have very limited actual medical useful information, right? So the, the example is, BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes, BRCA1, BRCA2, which are, um, you know, are well known for uh, increasing. If you have a mutation that is pathogenic in either of those two genes, you have a higher chance of getting uh, breast cancer, for example. Um, using the 23andMe test, they only look at three out of thousands of variants, which means the result that you're getting is very limited because it's actually only useful for less than 1% of the general population. If you want to look at your risk for breast cancer in your BRCA, BRCA1 or BRCA2 genes, you need to sequence completely the genes. And you only do that when you do whole genome sequencing. So that's the difference. Genotyping, small amount of DNA, limited information that comes out of that, and you're asking questions for which you know the answers to. Now sequencing, you literally sequence almost all for technical reasons, but let's just, um, let's just think you sequence all your genome, right, 6.4 billion uh, base pairs. And for some of those findings, we have answers, and some we don't because we're still discovering, right? But not only can we give you more complete and actionable and medically relevant insights, but we can also go back 
six months later and say, Alan, you sequenced your genome six months ago, and now there's some new uh, research happening that identified 10 more genes associated with a condition that you're interested in. Let's say schizophrenia. Do you want us to go and look and see, you know, what, what are we finding in your genome? Sure. You don't need to spit again. Your genome is already digitized. Mm -hmm. It's basically a file. And we can just go search it and give you back that insight. So it basically is a resource for your life that you can go back and extract value from. And that's mm -hmm. the difference between sequencing and genotyping. And look, I think part of this evolution into the era of the social genome is it makes no sense to do any more genotyping tests. The only reason this was done, it was because it was easier to do it and it was cheaper. But as the cost of sequencing your whole genome drops down and drops down and drops down to a couple of hundred dollars, there is no reason to do genotyping because you're missing a huge amount of information. And this takes us all the way to how this is being done now a million times, a million genomes are already on the path to be sequenced by 2021. Yeah, so look, the talking about the future is always is always difficult, right? We we've um, we have an idea of how fast we're scaling, and, uh, and I'll give you an example. Last November, we decided to to offer a thousand genomes uh, to the first thousand customers that would come to a website for one hundred and ninety nine dollars, um, and we thought we will do that for forty eight hours, either forty eight hours or a thousand genomes, whatever comes first. And we sold out in less than six hours. Mm -hmm. And we spend $358 on marketing, mm -hmm. which is basically nothing, yeah. right? So the demand is there. Um, you know, this year we'll probably finish between 15 and 17,000 genomes. Next year we're somewhere between eight and 10 times that. So, you know, we're, we are collectively on a path to, to, to have sequence a million people in 2021, 2022. That is the idea, right? And partly because as soon as we have a really, really good standardized set of genomes sequenced, we can now deploy machine learning tools to start to do research and identify new relationships between yes. genes, phenotypical data and conditions, mm -hmm. which you can do with just a few genomes, right? That is where precision medicine really comes Yes. To, to, to exist or to realize. Once we're able to identify relationships between genetic traits and you know, genetic uh, characteristics, phenotypical characteristics across a large set of standardized genomes. Yes, yes. So the data enables the insights that we would really like with precision medicine. Yeah, and there is no precision medicine, first of all, without you sequencing your genome. Like, mm -hmm. Because how are, you know, event to, in order to affect you, right, you need to know what are your genetic characteristics and other things in order to provide a precision treatment, a precise treatment, right? And also in order for us to identify all of these new insights, we need large scale standardized genomes. And I say standardized because for the most part, um, over the last 20 years, the people that have been doing, you know, sequencing DNA, including genomes, you know, it's a scientist that has 2,000 rigged together in his own spreadsheet. Then there's another scientist that she applied for a grant and put them in a different database. Like, they're all distributed in different standards from Excel to your own hodgepodge, you know, duct tape system. We need to standardize them. And we also have, obviously, a, a, a data strategy for that. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, to, to be able to actually get these key insights, I want you to speak on um, some of these everyday uh, assisting aspects that a whole genome sequence can actually do for you. So you gave us some of the, of the red, yellow, and, uh, and what was that last color, the green? Well, we the just blue? call it gray, gray. It's, it's just gray, like it's noteworthy, it's noteworthy. fine to know. Like, fine to nose because this <laughs> right. this dives into everything from the current uh, nutrition choices that we make to our health and life insurance to diseases and enhancements. That's right. Dating matching. There's so many interesting things. The marketplace for research is so cool. Like you said, with the big yeah. amount of data, we can actually open up the machine learning algorithms to find new relationships. So you should start exploring this area with us. Excite people about the social genome. Yeah. I mean, I'll give you an example of 
not only the breadth, but also the speed at which this is happening. So yesterday, uh, we, had a, we were, had a discussion with George Church, Jason Kelly, and Carl Schmieder and myself around synthetic biology, genetic engineering, opportunities and risks. And one of the things that George mentioned is, look, there may be some people interested in using genetic engineering not just to address diseases, et cetera, but to introduce additional diversity among human population. We understand the importance of diversity from the biological perspective, evolutionary perspective, and also other aspects, right? So just think about that for a second. Not only are we going to be able to start addressing over time certain conditions, first it'll be monogenic you know, conditions, eventually some more complicated, but also the ability to introduce genetic engineering to the human population has also to do with things like diversity, right? And that's yesterday. Today, you and I are talking about this, right? After this, I'm gonna to go to this event where we're um, talking at Harvard Medical School with another group of people around preventive genomics. How do we scale having people sequence their genome to prevent the onset of conditions, mm -hmm. right? And, and we know that this is already being introduced in the clinical setting. For example, the Mayo Clinic, uh, we have a collaboration with them and in their executive health program, they offer our product. So if you come and do your checkup, your annual checkup to check everything, they will also sequence your genome if you want and also use that information to prevent certain things from coming along, right? Now, in the afternoon, we have a panel today talking about the social genome, digital health and genetic engineering. Um, to address very specific things. And today is announced in the paper, as you, uh, you know, online, as you may have seen, uh, there's a new uh, genetic engineering therapeutic company that is gonna be Start Verf uh, Therapeutics that was just announced today addressing cardiovascular, right? So the, the number of things that are happening around our understanding of our genome together with other biodata and how to actually offer a product or a service to people is starting to expand, right? And so where does this go in the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years? Health insurance programs that take that into account. We know already that different insurance companies are looking into the space to be able to better understand your particular risks, right? So health and life insurance. Um, you bet somebody is already introducing, we already do it in certain communities, for example, uh, in some traditional Jewish communities, sort of a bit of niche matchmaking depending on certain, you know, certain genetic characteristics, right? So a more broadly um, genetic influenced Tinder world, sure. Um, where do I get a service if one of my kids has a particular condition or, or even if it's, I'm in the pregnancy pr process or embryo, who is going to offer the different services to be able to address and genetically engineer out, if you like, a particular condition? It's, it's coming. Mm -hmm. Is it five years? It, that doesn't matter. Five, 10, 15, of course, some of this is going to take some time. But we're entering that space, right? Um, so everything from the hardcore science and reading and editing and reading your genome to start to edit and to offer different products and services is this dynamic that we're entering, right? And it's similar to, again, to the digital revolution, right? There was very little you could do in the late 80s with your little Radio Shack, you know, computer or your Commodore 168. There were very few little things. We didn't have any of all of the things that we do today across our life, right? So that's sort of a, a, a good analog to see where we are moving towards. There's obviously legal issues, political issues, you know, um, ethical, moral, all of those, and they're very important. I mean, we should, you know, talk about them as well. So then, what does it look like for someone that has a concern about their data and privacy? You know, you listed that you're GDPR compliant. So teach us about this. Yeah. So I mean, privacy is obviously a a, a very important uh, topic, not just for us, but for many players in the industry. And by the way which is not different from other industries, right? There were times where people would say, I would never do online banking because what if somebody hacks my, my account and I lose all my money, right? I mean, th those were real concerns. Mm -hmm. And today, certain number of banks get hacked uh, around the world every once in a while. And, but we all do, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. not only on online banking and Venmo and PayPal, and we, I mean, it's like, you can't imagine your life today without you know, digital transactions of your money, period, right? So it's not unique to, to health. So what we do is, 
of all the possible standards that we can take, we take the highest standards, both in terms of our labs, how we treat with the, the, the data, how it's encrypted, how it's stored, all of that, we apply the highest standards, right? Um, but this is more of, a, of an important topic, not just for Veritas, but for any other player, right? Um, why? Because understandably, many of our consumers group together a concern that is, oh, well, Facebook is, you know, selling this data and, and 23andMe did a deal with a pharma company, then all of this uh, is out of my control. It's a very understandable fear, right? So what we need to do is we need to just continue building a trusting, you know, a trust relationship with our, with our consumers, with the members of the Veritas family, um, that not only are we taking the highest standards, that the service that we're providing to them is focused on what they need and how they need, right? Um, and, and evolving our, our services to respond to very specific needs while still in the back, you know, in the back end, taking all the technical precautions and encryption, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? So, you know, will there be some, uh, some hacking in this space uh, at some point? Of course. Like there is no, we, we, we've seen that every time we have a new sort of um, technology that allows for some people to abuse this, of course. We're trying to do the best we can to, to avoid that and not be, you know, those affected. Um, but I think this is, you know, this is, we need to have these conversations. And, and there's also, let me, let me point this out. So I was having a conversation with a friend and he said, look, I'm, I'm concerned that my, my genome is stored even though you encrypt it and, you know, and I said, look, why are you concerned? It's like, well, because it's, it's, in, it's my health data and I want it to be secure. And I said, okay, are you concerned that your last lab work and your last x-rays that you did at your hospital are still being sent around from fa via fax? Like, well, no, and actually that's a good point. Right, like we've, we've already assumed that when it goes into the healthcare system, it's okay, it's, it's fine, it's good enough. Even though we know it's completely hackable and even though we know it happens every once in a while, okay? So we need to take a stand, you know, we need to take a much better stand than what is the, the method right now or the, if you like, the level of, uh, of security in the traditional um, healthcare system. Now, the other question is, well, I'm concerned because my health insurance I want to know that I'm not as healthy as I am and therefore they're going to, you know, increase my premiums. And I said, okay, let's take that as an example. Let's say that you have Blue Cross Minnesota and they are, Alan, they are, somebody there is going to try to look at your health and see if you are less healthy than you said you are and increase your premiums. Let's just assume for a minute, right? The easiest thing is to have a 21-year-old working there look at your Facebook page and measure your waist size. That will give them a much clearer indication of when are you likely to have something like a cardiovascular issue than anything else right now. And if they want to go a little bit further, they could go into your Instagram and look at what you eat, right? Now, that's one case. Another case is there is a bioinformatician at this Blue Cross Blue Shield looking through your genome, identifying the variants, being able to, dis you know, to distill what are the risks and how much likely are you that not. Which of those two is more likely, right? That's one. The other is actually the, the health insurance companies and life insurance companies have all, and many of them have already approached us because they're working to find ways to develop new products that take into account your genomic and other bio data to, other, to be able to give you a product that better positions you in a risk curve as opposed to your mid-30s, you know, white male of the zip code that doesn't smoke, which is very much like, eh, right? So I think we're going to see a, an explosion of products and services. Some of them will be more real than others. And some of them will try to abuse it, sure. But I think we're going to see many more products and services based on not just our personal DNA, but also other bio data. Okay, and then the, 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 current, the current state of, of, the, of the technology seems to be that we, we take what is the saliva samples and we sequence that and then we store it and then we gain access to it and then do we get to be able to control any of the data flows themselves out to researchers? Do we get that permission? Yeah, sure. So uh, there's different ways to do this. Uh, one, for example, everyone that sequences their genome with us, we're, we ask them if they would like to participate in research. 
um, more than 80% of people say yes. And of course we do that. That doesn't mean that we then give your genome to a researcher at all. But if there is a particular researcher working on a, let's say, uh, doing a cardiovascular study and they want to ask a specific question about uh, 5,000 genomes, do they have this variant and also this variant, they could search, we, we could give them access to that search, including your genome, but they don't get the data, they might just get the answer and say, oh yes, actually, among 5,000 people, this variant also exists when this other variant is present, right? So that's the type of research we're talking about. It's not like we hand over your genome or anybody's genome to anyone. So that's, that's an important point. Now, um, there are other platforms that are emerging like Luna uh, or, or Nebula uh, and others that are uh, EncryptGen, you know, that are trying to figure out a model where if you upload some of your genetic information, then can you control bits, you know, bits of it to be able to serve a particular research effort? Um, and in some cases, can you get remunerated for that? You know, could you get somehow paid in tokens or in some form, some currency uh, for that? And I think that's, you know, we'll see more of those emerging. I think they're still trying to figure out exactly what the model is, but we're excited that, um, that, that they're doing that. And look, we, we thought about this from the beginning. The reason we didn't start a, a marketplace is because, you know, as a startup, you've got to focus. Uh, but, but, you know, that doesn't mean we're not going to mm -hmm. develop a marketplace like that in the future. And then why would I not just be comfortable with, what is it, the personal genome project mm -hmm. um, that enables me to just upload all of my yeah. sequence right up on the um, internet for anyone to be able to access? Yeah, so the Personal Genome Project is an effort that started at Harvard Medical School over more than 10 years ago. Actually, several of, of the people that, that founded that project are part of the Veritas team. Um, so that project, the goal was to be completely transparent and public with your information. And many people do that. Many people upload everything, not just their genome, but also other data uh, into the Personal Genome Project and, and open it up for research of any mm -hmm. form. And many people are very, and we're talking thousands and thousands, so many people are very comfortable about that. Uh, mm -hmm. And they don't see really any risk, um, you know, or, or the risks that there are there, they don't, they, you know, they don't, they don't worry about it. So, yeah, that, that is definitely another, another avenue for people to participate in research. Mm -hmm. And the only risks that could happen with something like that would be that a, a health insurance provider could look at that and then discriminate against you or that potentially you could maybe have some sort of a malevolent attack against you that's specific to your genome. Is this the, this the things to be concerned that's about? That's what people are concerned about. So right now in the U.S. we have what's called the GINA, the, you know, which is basically a non-discrimination uh, piece of legislation that does not allow a health insurance company to discriminate against you because of uh, something that you have in your gene, right? Uh, now, this does not apply to life insurance companies. Um, so I had recently a conversation with my life insurance company and I said, hey, um, they, you know, I, I was sick 10 years ago and they were, con they were concerned that one of my organs would still be damaged from that sickness 10 years ago. And I said, no, I don't. I, I, I talked to my doctor and I'm perfectly fine. And they said, well, we're still gonna have to pay, ask you to pay a little more in your premium. And I said, okay, so you're considering a risk possibility. And I said, okay, how about I tell you that I also, I do not have an E4 risk for Alzheimer's. I do not have a mutation in my BRCA1 and BRCA2 for breast cancer, because if you're gonna consider things, risks to, you know, charge me more. I want you to consider my risk profile to charge me less. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. no, 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 no. We can't do anything with your DNA yet, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Which is, mm -hmm. right now, they're basically hands off. But they're actually are figuring out, and I know this, um, uh, you know, for, from different conversations that we had with them, trying to figure out not necessarily a product that says, oh, let me look at your genome. But imagine, for example, that, you know, you know, life insurance B says, Alan, here's your policy, here's your premium. By the way, if you sequence your genome and you meet with your doctor reviewing those results, you, we don't need to see the information. We actually don't want any of that information. But if you demonstrate to us that you've sequenced it and you talk with your doctor about it, we'll give you a discount. 
Why? Because now you're more likely to know, your doctor is more likely to know one of the risks or several of the risks that need to be addressed, which means that you probably might be a healthier individual right. than otherwise. So I think we're going to start to see some of these, which you know we saw mm -hmm. it already in the driving, right? If you put this little thing, this little gadget in your car and you drive well, we'll give you a little mm -hmm. discount. Mm -hmm. You're basically lowering your risk profile. Yeah. I think we're going to see something similar with, uh, with, with whole genome sequencing. Yeah. There's so much to still dive into. I'm really excited to get to dive deeper into the nuance of the science. I'd love to hear some more of the thinking around how to open notebook science and open source the data and, mm -hmm. and uh, just decrease malevolent actors and increase mm -hmm. like the spiritual unity so that we can have precision medicine be at its fullest more easily. Um, there's still so much to talk about and it's really exciting to hear about Veritas bringing the cost down to whole genome sequencing down to under a thousand dollars. You had the $200 um, uh, special, special and, and it's looking like hopefully in the future we'll be able to get more and more people sequenced, uh, even potentially a million by 2021 is very exciting. Yeah, we think the cost, we think our price, uh, whole genome sequencing is probably going to be somewhere around $500 by the end of this year, 2019, and next year it'll be $200 or less. And therefore, and that changes, that changes the whole space, right? Um, yeah. That changes our ability to have more people uh, sequenced. We also participate in research projects. We're, we're now in a collaboration uh, with uh, the Genomes to People project uh, around the Franca, what is called the Franca Fund, and I invite everybody to research this where we're also donating for X number of people that sequence their genome, we're donating some genomes for underrepresented minorities, which is a huge important yes. aspect of research happening. We yes. need more minorities to participate um, and so we can, you know, obviously understand some of the genetic, uh, some of the genetic characteristics of many of these minorities, Hispanics included, as myself, right? Yes, yes, yes. What a great model, a, a kind of a, a potentially even like a buy one, donate one model. This exactly. could be so interesting. Yeah. All right. Huge thank you for tuning in, everyone. Rigo, thank you so much for coming onto the show. We greatly My pleasure. appreciate it. Yeah. Yes, this is welcome super to the fun. era of the social, social genome. genome. That's <laughs> right. That's right. It's coming. It's here. We're really excited. Everyone, check out the links below to Veritas. Also, check out Rodrigo's links below. And go and have more conversations with your friends, your family, your coworkers on social media about the era of the social genome. Start talking about this more and what it's going to be like. Go get sequenced ourselves. And support the artists, entrepreneurs, and organizations around the world that you believe in. Support Simulation. Our links are below so we can continue doing cool things like coming to Cambridge for interviews. And go and build the future, everyone. Manifest your dreams into the world. Huge thank you for tuning in, and we will see you soon. Peace.